Notes from the Underground by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Apropos to Wet Snow. Part Four. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Neufeld. Eight. It was some time, however, before I consented to recognize that truth. Waking up in the morning after some hours of heavy, leaden sleep, and immediately realizing all that had happened on the previous day, I was positively amazed at my last night's sentimentality with Liza, at all those outcries of horror and pity. To think of having such an attack of womanish hysteria, ah, I concluded. And what did I thrust my address upon her for? What if she comes? Let her come, though. It doesn't matter. But, obviously, that was not now the chief and the most important matter. I had to make haste, and at all costs, save my reputation in the eyes of Sverkov and Simonov as quickly as possible. That was the chief business, and I was so taken up that morning that I actually forgot all about Liza. First of all, I had at once to repay what I had borrowed the day before from Simonov. I resolved on a desperate measure, to borrow fifteen roubles straight off from Anton Antonitch. As luck would have it, he was in the best of humours that morning, and gave it to me at once, on the first asking. I was so delighted at this that, as I signed the I.O.U. with a swaggering air, I told him casually that the night before I had been keeping it up with some friends at the Hotel de Paris, and we were giving a farewell party to a comrade. In fact, I might say a friend of my childhood, and, you know, a, a, a desperate rake, fearfully spoilt, of course. He belongs to a good family, and has considerable means, a brilliant career. He is witty, charming, a regular loveless, you understand. We drag an extra half-dozen, and— and it went off all right. All this was uttered very easily, unconstrainedly and complacently. On reaching home, I promptly wrote to Simonov. To this hour I am lost in admiration when I recall the truly gentlemanly, good-humoured, candid tone of my letter. With tact and good breeding, and above all entirely without superfluous words, I blamed myself for all that had happened. I defended myself, if I really may be allowed to defend myself, by alleging that being utterly unaccustomed to wine, I had been intoxicated with the first glass, which, I said, I had drunk before they arrived, while I was waiting for them at the Hôtel de Paris, between five and six o'clock. I begged Simonov's pardon especially. I asked him to convey my explanations to all the others, especially to Sverkov, whom, I seemed to remember, as though in a dream, I had insulted. I added that I would have called upon all of them myself, but my head ached, and besides, I had not the face to. I was particularly pleased with a certain lightness, almost carelessness, strictly within the bounds of politeness, however, which was apparent in my style, and better than any possible arguments, gave them at once to understand that I took rather an independent view of all that unpleasantness last night, that I was by no means so utterly crushed as you, my friends, probably imagine, but on the contrary looked upon it as a gentleman serenely respecting himself should look upon it. On a young hero's past no censure is cast. There is actually an aristocratic playfulness about it, I thought admiringly, as I read over the letter, and it's all because I am an intellectual and cultivated man. Another man in my place would not have known how to extricate himself, but here I have got out of it, and am as jolly as ever again, and all because I am a cultivated and educated man of our day. And indeed, perhaps, everything was due to the wine yesterday. Hmm. No, it was not the wine. I did not drink anything at all between five and six when I was waiting for them. I had lied to Simonov. I had lied shamelessly, and indeed I wasn't ashamed now. Hang it all, though. The great thing was that I was rid of it. I put six roubles in the letter, sealed it up, 
and asked Apollon to take it to Semenoff. When he learned that there was money in the letter, Apollon became more respectful and agreed to take it. Towards evening I went out for a walk. My head was still aching and giddy after yesterday. But as evening came on and the twilight grew denser, my impressions, and following them my thoughts, grew more and more different and confused. Something was not dead within me. In the depths of my heart and conscience it would not die, and it showed itself in acute depression. For the most part I jostled my way through the most crowded business streets, along Meshevchansky Street, along Sadovy Street, and in the Yusupov Garden. I always liked particularly sauntering along these streets in the dusk, just when there were crowds of working people of all sorts going home from their daily work, with faces looking cross with anxiety. What I liked was just that cheap bustle, that bare prose. On this occasion the jostling of the streets irritated me more than ever. I could not make out what was wrong with me. I could not find the clue. Something seemed rising up continually in my soul, painfully, and, and refusing to be appeased. I returned home completely upset. It was just as though some crime were lying on my conscience. The thought that Liza was coming worried me continually. It seemed queer to me that of all my recollections of yesterday this tormented me, as it were, especially, as it were, quite separately. Everything else I had quite succeeded in forgetting by the evening. I dismissed it all, and was still perfectly satisfied with my letter to Simonov. But on this point I was not satisfied at all. It was as though I were worried only by Liza. What if she comes? I thought incessantly. Well, it doesn't matter. Let her come. It's horrid that she should see, for instance, how I live. Yesterday I seemed such a hero to her, while now... It's horrid, though, that I have let myself go so. The room looks like the beggars. And I brought myself to go out to dinner in such a suit, and my American leather sofa with a stuffing sticking out, and my dressing gown, which will not cover me, such tatters, and she will see all this, and she will see Apollon. That beast is certain to insult her. He will fasten upon her in order to be rude to me. And I, of course, shall be panic-stricken as usual. I shall begin bowing and scraping before her and pulling my dressing-gown round me. I shall begin smiling, telling lies. Oh, the beastliness! And it isn't the beastliness of it that matters most. There is something more important, more loathsome, viler. Yes, viler, and to put on that dishonest lying mask again. When I reached that thought I fired up all at once. Why dishonest? How dishonest? I was speaking sincerely last night. I remember there was real feeling in me, too. What I wanted was to excite an honourable feeling in her. Her crying was a good thing. It will have a good effect. Yet I could not feel at ease. All that evening, even when I had come back home, even after nine o'clock, when I calculated that Liza could not possibly come, still she haunted me, and what was worse, she came back to my mind always in the same position. One moment out of all that had happened last night stood vividly before my imagination. The moment when I struck a match and saw her pale, distorted face with its look of torture. And what a pitiful, what an unnatural, what a distorted smile she had at that moment. But I did not know then that fifteen years later I should still, in my imagination, see Liza, always with the pitiful, distorted, inappropriate smile which was on her face at that minute. Next day I was ready again to look upon it all as nonsense, due to overexcited nerves, and above all as exaggerated. I was always conscious of that weak point of mine, and sometimes very much afraid of it. I exaggerate everything. That is where I go wrong, I repeated to myself every hour. But, however, 
Liza will very likely come all the same, was the refrain with which all my reflections ended. I was so uneasy that I sometimes flew into a fury. She'll come. She is certain to come, I cried, running about the room. If not to-day, she will come to-morrow. She'll find me out. The damnable romanticism of these pure hearts. Ah, oh, the vileness, ah, oh, the silliness, ah, oh, the stupidity of these wretched sentimental souls. Why, how fail to understand? How could one fail to understand? But at this point I stopped short, and in great confusion indeed. And how few, how few words I thought in passing were needed. How little of the idyllic, and affectedly, bookishly, artificially idyllic, too, had sufficed to turn a whole human life at once according to my will. That's virginity, to be sure, freshness of soil. At once a thought occurred to me, to go to her, to tell her all, and beg her not to come to me. But this thought stirred such wrath in me that I believed I should have crushed that damned Eliza if she had chanced to be near me at the time. I should have insulted her, have spat at her, have turned her out, have struck her. One day passed, however, another and another. She did not come, and I began to grow calmer. I felt particularly bold and cheerful after nine o'clock. I even sometimes began dreaming, and rather sweetly. I, for instance, became the salvation of Liza, simply through her coming to me and my talking to her. I develop her, educate her. Finally, I notice that she loves me, loves me passionately. I pretend not to understand. I don't know, however, why I pretend, just for effect, perhaps. At last, all confusion, transfigured, trembling and sobbing, she flings herself at my feet and says that I am her saviour, and that she loves me better than anything in the world. I am amazed, but, Liza, I say, can you imagine that I have not noticed your love? I saw it all, I divined it, but I did not dare to approach you first, because I had an influence over you, and was afraid that you would force yourself, from gratitude, to respond to my love would try to rouse in your heart a feeling which was perhaps absent, and I did not wish that, because it would be tyranny. It would be indelicate. In short, I launch off at that point into European, inexplicably lofty subtleties a la George Saint. But now, now you are mine. You are my creation. You are pure. You are good. You are my noble wife. Into my house come bold and free, its rightful mistress there to be. Then we began living together, go abroad, and so on and so on. In fact, in the end, it seemed vulgar to me myself, and I began putting out my tongue at myself. Besides, they won't let her out, the hussy, I thought. They don't let them go out very readily, especially in the evening. For some reason I fancied she would come in the evening, and at seven o'clock precisely. Though she did say she was not altogether a slave there yet, and had certain rights. So, damn it all, she will come. She is sure to come. It was a good thing, in fact, that Apollon distracted my attention at that time by his rudeness. He drove me beyond all patience. He was the bane of my life, the curse laid upon me by providence. We had been squabbling continually for years, and I hated him. My God, how I hated him! I believe I had never hated anyone in my life as I hated him, especially at some moments. He was an elderly, dignified man, who worked part of his time as a tailor but for some unknown reason he despised me beyond all measure, and looked down upon me insufferably. Though, indeed, he looked down upon every one. Simply to glance at that flaxen, smoothly brushed head, at the tuft of hair he combed up on his forehead and oiled with sunflower oil, at that dignified mouth, compressed into the shape of the letter V, 
made one feel one was confronting a man who had never doubted of himself. He was a pedant to the most extreme point, the greatest pedant I had met on earth, and with that had a vanity only befitting Alexander of Macedon. He was in love with every button on his coat, every nail on his fingers, absolutely in love with them, and he looked it. In his behaviour to me he was a perfect tyrant, he spoke very little to me, and if he chanced to glance at me, he gave me a firm, majestically self-confident and invariably ironical look that drove me sometimes to fury. He did his work with the air of doing me the greatest favour, though he did scarcely anything for me, and did not indeed consider himself bound to do anything. There could be no doubt that he looked upon me as the greatest fool on earth, and that he did not get rid of me was simply that he could get wages from me every month. He consented to do nothing for me for seven roubles a month. Many sins should be forgiven me for what I suffered from him. My hatred reached such a point that sometimes his very step almost threw me into convulsions. What I loathed particularly was his lisp. His tongue must have been a little too long, or something of that sort, for he continually lisped, and seemed to be very proud of it, imagining that it greatly added to his dignity. He spoke in a slow, measured tone, with his hands behind his back and his eyes fixed on the ground. He maddened me particularly when he read aloud the psalms to himself behind his partition. Many a battle I waged over that reading. But he was awfully fond of reading aloud in the evenings, in a slow, even, sing-song voice, as though over the dead. It is interesting that that is how he has ended. He hires himself out to read the psalms over the dead, and at the same time he kills rats and makes blacking. But at that time I could not get rid of him. It was as though he were chemically combined with my existence. Besides, nothing would have induced him to consent to leave me. I could not live in furnished lodgings. My lodging was my private solitude, my shell, my cave, in which I concealed myself from all mankind. And Apollon seemed to me, for some reason, an integral part of that flat and for seven years I could not turn him away. To be two or three days behind his wages, for instance, was impossible. He would have made such a fuss I should not have known where to hide my head. But I was so exasperated with every one during those days that I made up my mind for some reason and with some object to punish Apollon and not to pay him for a fortnight the wages that were owing him. I had, for a long time, for the last two years, been intending to do this, simply in order to teach him not to give himself airs with me, and to show him that if I liked, I could withhold his wages. I purposed to say nothing to him about it, and was purposely silent indeed, in order to score off his pride, and force him to be the first to speak of his wages. Then I would take the seven roubles out of a drawer, show him I have the money put aside on purpose, but that I won't, I won't, I simply won't pay him his wages. I won't just because that is what I wish, because I am master and it is for me to decide, because he has been disrespectful, because he has been rude. But if he were to ask respectfully, I might be softened and give it to him. Otherwise he might wait another fortnight, another three weeks, a whole month. But angry as I was, yet he got the better of me. I could not hold out for four days. He began as he always did begin in such cases, for there had been such cases already. There had been attempts and it may be observed i knew all this beforehand i knew his nasty tactics by heart he would begin by fixing upon me an exceedingly severe stare keeping it up for several minutes at a time particularly on meeting me or seeing me out of the house if i held out and pretended not to notice those stares he would still in silence proceed to further tortures 
all at once, apropos of nothing, he would walk softly and smoothly into my room when I was pacing up and down or reading, stand at the door, one hand behind his back and one foot behind the other, and fix upon me a stare more than severe, utterly contemptuous. If I suddenly asked him what he wanted, he would make no answer, but continue staring at me persistently for some seconds, then, with a peculiar compression of his lips and a most significant air, deliberately turn round and deliberately go back to his room. Two hours later he would come out again and again present himself before me in the same way. It had happened that, in my fury, I did not even ask him what he wanted, but simply raised my head sharply and imperiously, and began staring back at him. So we stared at one another for two minutes. At last he turned with deliberation and dignity, and went back again for two hours. If I were still not brought to reason by all this, but persisted in my revolt, he would suddenly begin sighing while he looked at me, long deep sighs, as though measuring by them the depths of my moral degradation, and of course it ended at last by his triumphing completely. I raged and shouted, but still was forced to do what he wanted. This time the usual staring manoeuvres had scarcely begun when I lost my temper and flew at him in a fury. I was irritated beyond endurance apart from him. Stay, I cried in a frenzy, as he was slowly and silently turning, with one hand behind his back, to go to his room. Stay, come back, come back, I tell you. And I must have bawled so unnaturally that he turned round and even looked at me with some wonder. However, he persisted in saying nothing, and that infuriated me. How dare you come and look at me like that without being sent for? Answer! After looking at me calmly for half a minute, he began turning round again. Stay! I ordered, running up to him. Don't stir! There! Answer, now! What did you come in to look at? If you have any order to give me, it's my duty to carry it out, he answered, after another silent pause, with a slow measured lisp, raising his eyebrows and calmly twisting his head from one side to another, all this with exasperating composure. That's not what I am asking you about, you torturer, I shouted, turning crimson with anger. I'll tell you why you came here myself. You see, I don't give you your wages. You are so proud you don't want to bow down and ask for it, and so you come to punish me with your stupid stares to worry me and you have no suspicion how stupid it is. Stupid, 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 stupid! He would have turned round again without a word, but I seized him. Listen, I shouted to him. Here's the money. Do you see? Here it is. I took it out of the table drawer. Here's the seven roubles complete. But you are not going to have it. You are not going to have it until you come respectfully with bowed head to beg my pardon. Do you hear? That cannot be, he answered, with the most unnatural self-confidence. It shall be so, I said. I give you my word of honor, it shall be. And there's nothing for me to beg your pardon for he went on, as though he had not noticed my exclamations at all. Why, besides, you called me a torturer, for which I can summon you at the police station at any time for insulting behavior. Go, summon me, I roared. Go at once this very minute, this very second. You are a torturer all the same, a torturer. But he merely looked at me, then turned and regardless of my loud calls to him, he walked to his room with an even step, and without looking round. If it had not been for Liza, nothing of this would have happened, I decided inwardly. Then, after waiting a minute, 
I went myself behind his screen with a dignified and solemn air, though my heart was beating slowly and violently. Apollon, I said quietly and emphatically, though I was breathless, go at once without a minute's delay, and fetch the police officer. He had meanwhile settled himself at his table, put on his spectacles, and taken up some sewing. But hearing my order, he burst into a guffaw. At once, go this minute, go on, or else you can't imagine what will happen. You are certainly out of your mind, he observed, without even raising his head, lisping as deliberately as ever, and threading his needle. Who ever heard of a man sending for the police against himself? And as for being frightened, you are upsetting yourself about nothing, for nothing will come of it. Go! I shrieked clutching him by the shoulder. I felt I should strike him in a minute. But I did not notice the door from the passage softly and slowly open at that instant, and a figure come in, stop short, and begin staring at us in perplexity. I glanced, nearly swooned with shame, and rushed back to my room. There, clutching at my hair with both hands, I leaned my head against the wall and stood motionless in that position. Two minutes later I heard Apollon's deliberate footsteps. "'There is some woman asking for you,' he said, looking at me with peculiar severity. Then he stood aside and let in Liza. He would not go away, but stared at us sarcastically. "'Go away! Go away!' I commanded in desperation. At that moment my clock began whirring and wheezing, and struck seven. Nine. Into my house come bold and free, its rightful mistress there to be. I stood before her crushed, crestfallen, revoltingly confused, and I believe I smiled, as I did my utmost to wrap myself in the skirts of my ragged, wadded dressing-gown, exactly as I had imagined the sea not long before in a fit of depression. After standing over us for a couple of minutes, Apollon went away, but that did not make me more at ease. What made it worse was that she, too, was overwhelmed with confusion, more so, in fact, than I should have expected. At the sight of me, of course. "'Sit down,' I said mechanically, moving a chair up to the table, and I sat down on the sofa. She obediently sat down at once, and gazed at me open-eyed, evidently expecting something from me at once. This naivete of expectation drove me to fury, but I restrained myself. She ought to have tried not to notice, as though everything had been as usual. But instead of that she and I dimly felt that I should make her pay dearly for all this. "'You have found me in a strange position, Liza,' I began, stammering and knowing that this was the wrong way to begin. "'No, no, don't imagine anything,' I cried, seeing that she had suddenly flushed. "'I am not ashamed of my poverty. On the contrary, I look with pride on my poverty. I am poor but honourable. One can be poor and honourable, I muttered. However, would you like tea? No, she was beginning. Wait a minute. I leaped up and ran to Apollon. I had to get out of the room somehow. Apollon, I whispered in feverish haste, flinging down before him the seven roubles which had remained all the time in my clenched fist. Here are your wages. You see, I give them to you. But for that, you must come to my rescue. Bring me tea and a dozen rusks from the restaurant. If you won't go, you'll make me a miserable man. You don't know what this woman is. This is everything. You may be imagining something, but you don't know what that woman is. Apollon, who had already sat down to his work and put on his spectacles again, at first glanced askance at the money, without speaking or putting down his needle. Then, without paying the slightest attention to me or making any answer, he went on busying himself with his needle, 
which he had not yet threaded. I waited before him for three minutes with my arms crossed a la Napoleon. My temples were moist with sweat. I was pale. I felt it. But thank God he must have been moved to pity, looking at me. Having threaded his needle, he deliberately got up from his seat, deliberately moved back his chair, deliberately took off his spectacles, deliberately counted the money, and finally, asking me over his shoulder, "'Shall I get a whole portion?' deliberately walked out of the room. As I was going back to Liza, the thought occurred to me on the way, "'Shouldn't I run away, just as I was in my dressing-gown, no matter where, and then let happen what would?' I sat down again. She looked at me uneasily. For some minutes we were silent. "'I will kill him!' I shouted suddenly, striking the table with my fist, so that the ink spurted out of the inkstand. "'What are you saying?' she cried, starting. "'I will kill him! Kill him!' I shrieked, suddenly striking the table in absolute frenzy, and at the same time fully understanding how stupid it was to be in such a frenzy. "'You don't know, Liza, what that torturer is to me. He is my torturer. He has gone now to fetch some rusks. He... and suddenly I burst into tears. It was an hysterical attack. How ashamed I felt in the midst of my sobs, but still I could not restrain them. She was frightened. "'What is the matter? What is wrong?' she cried, fussing about me. "'Water! Give me water! Over there!' I muttered in a faint voice, though I was inwardly conscious that I could have got on very well without water, and without muttering in a faint voice. But I was, what is called, putting it on, to save appearances, though the attack was a genuine one. She gave me water, looking at me in bewilderment. At that moment Apollon brought in the tea. It suddenly seemed to me that this commonplace prosaic tea was horribly undignified and paltry after all that had happened, and I blushed crimson. Liza looked at Apollon with positive alarm. He went out without a glance at either of us. "'Liza, do you despise me?' I asked, looking at her fixedly, trembling with impatience to know what she was thinking. She was confused, and did not know what to answer. "'Drink your tea,' I said to her angrily. I was angry with myself, but of course it was she who would have to pay for it. A horrible spite against her suddenly surged up in my heart. I believe I could have killed her. To revenge myself on her I swore inwardly not to say a word to her all the time. She is the cause of it all. I thought. Our silence lasted for five minutes. The tea stood on the table. We did not touch it. I had got to the point of purposely refraining from beginning in order to embarrass her further. It was awkward for her to begin alone. Several times she glanced at me with mournful perplexity. I was obstinately silent. I was, of course, myself the chief sufferer because I was fully conscious of the disgusting meanness of my spiteful stupidity, and yet at the same time I could not restrain myself. "'I want to get away from there altogether,' she began, to break the silence in some way. But, poor girl, that was just what she ought not to have spoken about at such a stupid moment to a man so stupid as I was. My heart positively ached with pity for her tactless and unnecessary straightforwardness. But something hideous at once stifled all compassion in me. It even provoked me to greater venom. I did not care what happened. Another five minutes passed. Perhaps I am in your way, she began timidly, hardly audibly, and was getting up but as soon as I saw this first impulse of wounded dignity, I positively trembled with spite, and at once burst out. "'Why have you come to me? Tell me that, please,' I began, 
gasping for breath and regardless of logical connection in my words. I longed to have it all out at once, at one burst. I did not even trouble how to begin. "'Why have you come? Answer! Answer!' I cried, hardly knowing what I was doing. "'I'll tell you, my good girl, why you have come. You've come because I talked sentimental stuff to you then. So now you are soft as butter and longing for fine sentiments again. So you may as well know that I was laughing at you then, and I am laughing at you now. Why are you shuddering? Yes, I was laughing at you. I had been insulted just before at dinner by the fellows who came that evening before me. I came to you meaning to thrash one of them, an officer. But I didn't succeed. I didn't find him. I had to avenge the insult on someone to get back my own again. You turned up. I vented my spleen on you and laughed at you. I had been humiliated, so I wanted to humiliate. I had been treated like a rag, so I wanted to show my power. That's what it was, and you imagined I had come there on purpose to save you. Yes, you imagined that? You imagined that? I knew that she would perhaps be muddled and not take it all in exactly, but I knew, too, that she would grasp the gist of it very well indeed, and so, indeed, she did. She turned white as a handkerchief, tried to say something, and her lips worked painfully, but she sank on a chair as though she had been felled by an axe, and all the time afterwards she listened to me with her lips parted and her eyes wide open, shuddering with awful terror. The cynicism, the cynicism of my words overwhelmed her. "'Save you,' I went on, jumping up from my chair and running up and down the room before you. "'Save you from what? But perhaps I am worse than you myself. Why didn't you throw it in my teeth when I was giving you that sermon?' But what did you come here yourself for? Was it to read as a sermon? Power, power was what I wanted then. Sport was what I wanted. I wanted to wring out your tears, your humiliation, your hysteria. That was what I wanted then. Of course I couldn't keep it up then, because I am a wretched creature. I was frightened, and the devil knows why, gave you my address in my folly. Afterwards, before I got home, I was cursing and swearing at you because of that address. I hated you already because of the lies I had told you. Because I only like playing with words, only dreaming. But do you know, what I really want is that you should all go to hell. That is what I want. I want peace. Yes, I'd sell the whole world for a farthing, straight off, so long as I was left in peace. Is the world to go to pot, or am I to go without my tea? I say that the world may go to pot for me, so long as I always get my tea. Did you know that, or not? Well, anyway, I know that I am a blackguard, a scoundrel, an egoist, a sluggard. Here I have been, shuddering for the last three days at the thought of your coming, and do you know what has worried me particularly for those three days? That I posed as such a hero to you, and now you would see me in a wretched, torn dressing-gown, beggarly, loathsome. I told you just now that I was not ashamed of my poverty, so you may as well know that I am ashamed of it. I am more ashamed of it than of anything more afraid of it than of being found out if I were a thief, because I am as vain as though I had been skinned and the very air blowing on me hurt. Surely by now you must realize that I shall never forgive you for having found me in this wretched dressing-gown, just as I was flying at Apollon like a spiteful cur. The saviour, the former hero, was flying like a mangy, unkempt sheep-dog at his lackey, and the lackey was jeering at him. 
and I shall never forgive you for the tears I could not help shedding before you just now, like some silly woman put to shame. And for what I am confessing to you now I shall never forgive you either. Yes, you must answer for it all, because you turned up like this, because I am a blackguard, because I am the nastiest, stupidest, absurdest, and most envious of all the worms on earth, who are not a bit better than I am, but, the devil knows why, are never put to confusion, while I shall always be insulted by every louse. That is my doom. And what is it to me that you don't understand a word of this? And what do I care? What do I care about you and whether you go to ruin there or not? Do you understand? How I shall hate you now after saying this, for having been here and listening. Why, it's not once in a lifetime a man speaks out like this, and then it is in hysterics. What more do you want? Why do you still stand confronting me after all this? Why are you worrying me? Why don't you go? But at this point a strange thing happened. I was so accustomed to think and imagine everything from books and to picture everything in the world to myself just as I had made it up in my dreams beforehand that I could not all at once take in this strange circumstance. What happened was this. Liza, insulted and crushed by me, understood a great deal more than I imagined. She understood from all this what a woman understands first of all, if she feels genuine love. That is, that I was myself unhappy. The frightened and wounded expression on her face was followed first by a look of sorrowful perplexity. When I began calling myself a scoundrel and a blackguard, and my tears flowed, the tirade was accompanied throughout by tears, her whole face worked convulsively. She was on the point of getting up and stopping me. When I finished, she took no notice of my shouting, Why are you here? Why don't you go away? But realized only that it must have been very bitter to me to say all this. Besides, she was so crushed, poor girl. She considered herself infinitely beneath me. How could she feel anger or resentment? She suddenly leaped up from her chair with an irresistible impulse and held out her hands, yearning towards me, though still timid and not daring to stir. At this point there was a revulsion in my heart, too. Then she suddenly rushed to me, threw her arms round me, and burst into tears, I, too, could not restrain myself, and sobbed as I never had before. They won't let me. I can't be good, I managed to articulate. Then I went to the sofa, fell on it face downwards, and sobbed on it for a quarter of an hour in genuine hysterics. She came close to me, put her arms round me, and stayed motionless in that position. But the trouble was that the hysterics could not go on forever, and, I am writing the loathsome truth, lying face downwards on the sofa with my face thrust into my nasty leather pillow, I began by degrees to be aware of a far away, involuntary, but irresistible feeling that it would be awkward now for me to raise my head and look Liza straight in the face. Why was I ashamed? I don't know, but I was ashamed. The thought, too, came into my overwrought brain that our parts now were completely changed, that she was now the heroine, while I was just a crushed and humiliated creature, as she had been before me that night, four days before. And all this came into my mind during the minutes I was lying on my face on the sofa. My God! Surely I was not envious of her, then. I don't know. To this day I cannot decide, and at the time, of course, I was still less able to understand what I was feeling than now. I cannot get on without domineering and tyrannizing over someone. But there is no explaining anything by reasoning, 
and so it is useless to reason. I conquered myself, however, and raised my head. I had to do so sooner or later, and I am convinced to this day that it was just because I was ashamed to look at her that another feeling was suddenly kindled and flamed up in my heart, a feeling of mastery and possession. My eyes gleamed with passion, and I gripped her hands tightly. How I hated her, and how I was drawn to her at that minute! The one feeling intensified the other. It was almost like an act of vengeance. At first there was a look of amazement, even of terror, on her face, but only for one instant. She warmly and rapturously embraced me. 10. A quarter of an hour later I was rushing up and down the room in frenzied impatience. From minute to minute I went up to the screen and peeped through the crack at Liza. She was sitting on the ground with her head leaning against the bed, and must have been crying. But she did not go away, and that irritated me. This time she understood it all. I had insulted her, finally, but there's no need to describe it. She realized that my outburst of passion had been simply revenge, a fresh humiliation, and that to my earlier almost causeless hatred was added now a personal hatred, born of envy though I do not maintain positively that she understood all this distinctly, but she certainly did fully understand that I was a despicable man, and what was worse, incapable of loving her. I know I shall be told that this is incredible, but it is incredible to be as spiteful and stupid as I was. It may be added that it was strange I should not love her, or at any rate appreciate her love why is it strange in the first place by then i was incapable of love for i repeat with me loving meant tyrannizing and showing my moral superiority i have never in my life been able to imagine any other sort of love and have nowadays come to the point of sometimes thinking that love really consists in the right freely given by the beloved object to tyrannize over her even in my underground dreams I did not imagine love except as a struggle. I began it always with hatred, and ended it with moral subjugation, and afterwards I never knew what to do with the subjugated object. And what is there to wonder at in that, since I had succeeded in so corrupting myself, since I was so out of touch with real life, as to have actually thought of reproaching her and putting her to shame for having come to me to hear fine sentiments, and did not even guess that she had not come to hear fine sentiments, but to love me, because to a woman all reformation, all salvation from any sort of ruin, and all moral renewal is included in love and can only show itself in that form. I did not hate her so much, however, when I was running about the room and peeping through the crack in the screen. I was only insufferably oppressed by her being here. I wanted her to disappear. I wanted peace to be left alone in my underground world. Real life oppressed me with its novelty so much that I could hardly breathe. But several minutes passed, and she still remained, without stirring, as though she were unconscious. I had the shamelessness to tap softly at the screen, as though to remind her. She started, sprang up, and flew to seek her kerchief, her hat, her coat, as though making her escape from me. Two minutes later she came from behind the screen and looked with heavy eyes at me. I gave a spiteful grin, which was forced, however, to keep up appearances and I turned away from her eyes. "'Good-bye,' she said, going towards the door. I ran up to her, seized her hand, opened it, thrust something in it, and closed it again. Then I turned at once and dashed away in haste to the other corner of the room, to avoid seeing anyway. I did mean a moment since to tell a lie, to write that I did this accidentally, not knowing what I was doing through foolishness, through losing my head. But I don't want to lie, 
and so I will say straight out that I open her hand and put the money in it from spite. It came into my head to do this while I was running up and down the room, and she was sitting behind the screen. But this I can say for certain. Though I did that cruel thing purposely, it was not an impulse from the heart, but came from my evil brain. This cruelty was so affected, so purposely made up, so completely a product of the brain of books, that I could not even keep it up a minute. First I dashed away to avoid seeing her, and then, in shame and despair, rushed after Liza. I opened the door in the passage and began listening. "'Liza! Liza!' I cried on the stairs, in a low voice, not boldly. There was no answer, but I fancied I heard her footsteps lowered down on the stairs. "'Liza!' I cried more loudly. "'No answer!' But at that minute I heard the stiff outer glass door open heavily with a creak and slam violently. The sound echoed up the stairs. She had gone. I went back to my room in hesitation. I felt horribly oppressed. I stood still at the table beside the chair on which she had sat and looked aimlessly before me. A minute passed. Suddenly I started. Straight before me, on the table, I saw—in short, I saw a crumpled blue five-rouble note, the one I had thrust into her hand a minute before. It was the same note. It could be no other, for there was no other in the flat. So she had managed to fling it from her hand on the table at the moment when I had dashed into the further corner. Well, I might have expected that she would do that. Might I have expected it? No, I was such an egoist, I was so lacking in respect for my fellow creatures, that I could not even imagine she would do so. I could not endure it. A minute later I flew like a madman to dress, flinging on what I could at random, and ran headlong after her. She could not have got two hundred paces away when I ran out into the street. It was a still night, and the snow was coming down in masses and falling almost perpendicularly, covering the pavement and the empty street as though with a pillow. There was no one in the street, no sound was to be heard. The street lamps gave a disconsolate and useless glimmer. I ran two hundred paces to the crossroads and stopped short. Where had she gone? And why was I running after her? Why? to fall down before her, to sob with remorse, to kiss her feet, to entreat her forgiveness. I longed for that. My whole breast was being rent to pieces, and never, never shall I recall that minute with indifference. But what for, I thought, should I not begin to hate her, perhaps even to-morrow, just because I had kissed her feet to-day? Should I give her happiness? Had I not recognized that day for the hundredth time what I was worth? Should I not torture her? I stood in the snow, gazing into the troubled darkness, and pondered this. And will it not be better, I mused fantastically, afterwards at home, stifling the living pang of my heart with fantastic dreams, Will it not be better that she should keep the resentment of the insult forever? Resentment? Why, it is purification. It is a most stinging and painful consciousness. Tomorrow I should have defiled her soul and have exhausted her heart, while now the feeling of insult will never die in her heart, and however loathsome the filth awaiting her, the feeling of insult will elevate and purify her by hatred. Oh, perhaps, too, by forgiveness. Or would all that make things easier for her, though? And, indeed, I will ask on my own account here an idle question. Which is better, cheap happiness or exalted sufferings? Well, which is better? So I dreamed as I sat at home that evening, 
almost dead with the pain in my soul never had i endured such suffering and remorse yet could there have been the faintest doubt when i ran out from my lodging that i should turn back half-way i never met liza again and i have heard nothing of her i will add too that i remained for a long time afterwards pleased with the phrase about the benefit from resentment and hatred in spite of the fact that i almost fell ill from misery even now so many years later all this is somehow a very evil memory i have many evil memories now but hadn't i better end my notes here i believe i made a mistake in beginning to write them anyway i have felt ashamed all the time i've been writing this story so it's hardly literature so much as a corrective punishment why to tell long stories showing how i have spoiled my life through morally rotting in my corner through lack of fitting environment through divorce from real life and rankling spite in my underground world would certainly not be interesting a novel needs a hero and all the traits of an anti-hero are expressly gathered together here and what matters most it all produces an unpleasant impression for we are all divorced from life we are all cripples every one of us more or less we are so divorced from it that we feel at once a sort of loathing for real life and so cannot bear to be reminded of it why we have come almost to looking upon real life as an effort almost as hard work and we are all privately agreed that it is better in books and why do we fuss and fume sometimes why are we perverse and ask for something else we don't know what ourselves it would be the worse for us if our petulant prayers were answered come try give any one of us for instance a little more independence untie our hands widen the spheres of our activity relax the control and we yes i assure you we should be begging to be under control again at once i know that you will very likely be angry with me for that and will begin shouting and stamping speak for yourself you will say and for your miseries in your underground holes and don't dare to say all of us excuse me gentlemen i am not justifying myself with that all of us as for what concerns me in particular i have only in my life carried to an extreme what you have not dared to carry halfway and what's more you have taken your cowardice for good sense and have found comfort in deceiving yourselves so that perhaps after all there is more life in me than in you look into it more carefully why we don't even know what living means now what it is and what it is called leave us alone without books and we shall be lost and in confusion at once we shall not know what to join on to what to cling to what to love and what to hate what to respect and what to despise we are oppressed at being men men with a real individual body and blood we are ashamed of it we think it a disgrace and try to contrive to be some sort of impossible generalized man we are still born and for generations past have been begotten not by living fathers and that suits us better and better we are developing a taste for it soon we shall contrive to be born somehow from an idea but enough i don't want to write more from underground the notes of this paradoxalist do not end here however he could not refrain from going on with them but it seems to us that we may stop here end of notes from the underground by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett